I've mentioned several times that one prominent theory says that life may have originated in hydrothermal vents at the bottom of the oceans. This is not by any means a universal belief among scientists, though the model does nicely sidestep several important drawbacks of life originating near the surface, and provides a handy way to get all the required elements together next to a strong source of energy and nutrients. Hydrothermal vents were discovered in 1949 when an automated underwater probe reported that certain areas of the Red Sea were anomalously hot. In the 1960s, further work established this effect and measured elevated seafloor temperatures related to an active seafloor rift. It wasn't until 1977 when a submersible craft actually first imaged these locations on the Galapagos Rift in the East Pacific Rise, which lies in the deep ocean off the coast of the Galapagos Islands. Photography showed a remarkable array of undersea volcanic activity, with scalding hot mineral-rich water pumping from below the Earth's crust. Hydrothermal vents have now been discovered in both Atlantic and Pacific Oceans, and in 1979 they were visited by human beings for the first time in an underwater submersible vehicle operated by the American Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution. The most remarkable thing about deep-sea hydrothermal vents is that, although they are often several miles deep in the total blackness of the ocean floor, with boiling water full of sulphites so hot and poisonous to kill most life on contact, and even though they exist at water pressures many hundreds of times what we experience at the surface, they are still teeming with life. Wonderful, fascinating, bizarre, extraordinary, almost alien life, but life nonetheless, based on DNA just like ours, and fitting within the tree of life that covers all the other ocean and land-dwelling creatures on Earth. Could it be that these locations may have been the very cradles of life on Earth? A less hospitable place could scarcely be imagined, but then life has an amazing ability to persist in pretty much any extreme environment we can throw at it. So we've explored a potential location for the origin of life, or at least for the origin of some of its vital precursors, and we've also been introduced, albeit briefly, to the RNA world hypothesis, which states that RNA, a molecule like DNA, was the first to evolve, with DNA coming later on. So let's talk about RNA a little bit more. The so-called RNA world hypothesis admittedly does little more than plug a few gaps in our understanding of abiogenesis. We still need to explain the origins of the RNA world itself, and this is not straightforward. Still, it is certainly a good step forward. RNA has several important properties which make it a sensible candidate for a precursor to DNA. Firstly, RNA strands can replicate themselves. This is a vital property of any candidate for the stage before the arrival of DNA. Moving from a non-replicating molecule right through to a complex replicating molecule like DNA seems unlikely. Remember that evolution generally works in small steps, and when you put a large number of small steps together you often get a huge change. But if any of those individual steps is too wide, then it will never happen. So in order for us to get a plausible model of abiogenesis, we must first identify a sequence of smaller steps that could lead us from the primordial soup of chemicals right through to the DNA in cells. So the fact that RNA can replicate itself is a huge clue that this may have been a precursor. But there are other clues. Most importantly, RNA is considerably simpler than DNA, which is good. Also, it can self catalyze as we saw earlier. RNA can catalyze its own replication, and hence massively improve the rate at which small numbers of RNA molecules could grow into a viable reproductive population. And finally, and this is probably a good clue too, RNA is still used in the cells of living animals today to carry out the transcription and replication of DNA molecules. The fact that RNA still performs this role is a big clue that it may have once performed that role for itself earlier on. Finally, the RNA world hypothesis has found some experimental support recently by studies such as a 2009 paper in the journal Nature by John Sutherland and collaborators from the University of Manchester. Existing models have assumed that RNA must have been formed from activated ribonucleotides, a process which is documented and supported by experimental evidence. However, the construction of those ribonucleotides is problematic. The main ingredients required are ribose, that's sugar, and nucleobases. Nucleobases are easy to form, but ribose is not, and there's no reasonable hypothesis for how it was generated in sufficient amounts to allow for the formation of ribonucleotides. However, the paper looks at this problem in a different way. Ribonucleotides are indeed constructed from ribose and nucleobases, but it's possible that they originally arose from a different process, one which did not proceed via either of these intermediate chemicals, and built up the ribonucleotides from different building blocks. And this paper claims to have demonstrated such a process, which starts with a soup of chemicals that were probably available on the early Earth, 
and builds up a certain kind of activated ribonucleotide in a more complicated but chemically far more plausible route. Of course, it's far too early to verify that this was definitely the way that the first self-replicating DNA molecules arose, but it's certainly a good start. Once we have RNA, the next step is obviously to build cells. The cell is an absolutely vital stage in the origin of life. Cells hold together the nucleic acids in which genetic codes are imprinted, together with the molecules required to replicate them. The catalysts required to speed up this process, and all the other cellular machinery in one self-contained region. They control which chemicals are allowed to enter and leave this environment, and they ultimately divide and build up our bodies, even leaving our bodies as gametes to go through the process of fertilisation and to create new life. Of course, primordial cells needn't have done almost any of this. There was no requirement for sexual reproduction, cells would have split asexually. The majority of the cellular apparatus, though vital today, could easily have built up over time. All that was really required for a primitive cell was a membrane, which would hold a strand of RNA or DNA in one place, together with some of the chemicals required for its replication. Even this simple primitive cell would provide a huge advantage over having RNA molecules floating randomly in the ocean currents, having to rely on luck to end up in areas where the required building blocks and catalyst for replication were present in large enough quantities. It may have been that the evolution of the cell was an unlikely event, but it's clear that it provided so many enormous advantages once it arose that it was bound to become widespread extremely quickly. It seems strange when talking about enormous geological timescales in billions of years, but it's altogether possible that the transition from free-floating RNA molecules to primitive cells, once it got going, might have proceeded in human timescales rather than planetary ones. A primary component of the evolution of the cell is definitely the concept of a lipid bilayer, which is a naturally occurring chemical structure consisting of two layers of a certain kind of fat molecules which join together and form a watertight bond in a layer a few nanometers, that is billionths of a meter, thick. Lipid bilayers form the membranes of pretty much all cells, including those in your own body, and they're remarkably easy to form. In fact, when the correct chemicals are available in the presence of water, they form spontaneously. This is very good news for our theory. The other thing that lipid bilayers can do is form into a ball called a liposome, which is a spherical shell with a wall made from lipids in this bilayer configuration. Again, these structures form naturally just because of the chemistry of lipids in contact with water. And when they contain other liquid inside, they're known as vesicles, and these are the most likely precursors to modern cells. Why they're such a likely candidate seems obvious. We know that liposomes form naturally in the presence of water, and modern cells are indeed made from this exact material. Were phospholipids available in the early Earth? Again, this poses a few problems. Lipids were certainly able to form from the chemicals available, but the main problem is getting lipids in a sufficient concentration to form vesicles. Studies led by Shostak and collaborators at Harvard in 2009 have been studying this process and believe that they can demonstrate mechanisms for generating sufficient lipid concentrations in the neighbourhood of hydrothermal vents. So the pieces are all gradually coming together. So let's briefly look at a summary of what we've discussed and a plausible model for the origin of life on Earth. Firstly, amino acids and other organic molecules are formed in the oceans, possibly around hydrothermal vents. This process is not only plausible, but has been adequately demonstrated by experimentation, so is no longer in any doubt. Two, lipid bilayers form. There are problems here getting lipids to occur in sufficient concentration for the bilayers to form and to build themselves into the vesicles, or hollow spherical shells, which were the most likely precursor to modern cells. Recent work has shown this is plausible, if not yet certain. Three, self-replicating RNA strings arise. RNA is by far the most likely precursor to DNA, for many reasons that we saw earlier. RNA is likely built from activated ribonucleotides, possibly by the process we saw a few slides earlier, which has been demonstrated in 2009. Work is continuing in this area too. 4. RNA strings merge with the bilayer vesicles to form primitive cells. When RNA strings and the molecules they require for replication all coexist within one vesicle, then there is an enormous bonus to the replication of those RNA molecules, and hence they will become much more common. 5. Finally, as the contents of these vesicles change, and we get RNA strings in shells with precisely the correct mix of molecules, then the formation of far more complex RNA strings can occur, and eventually, through the replacement of thymine for uracil and a few other minor changes in the structure of the RNA, we get DNA 
which forms the basis of all life on Earth today. Abiogenesis is perhaps one of the most difficult subjects in all of biology to approach from any perspective, a layman's or an expert's. The best option when attempting to explain it is first and foremost to be honest from the beginning and admit that science simply doesn't have all the answers yet. The scientific community is still very much in the process of patching holes in our understanding of this distant period in the story of life. Lack of understanding does not mean that we're on the wrong lines. We just need to keep looking. Most creationist arguments revolve around some variations on the common complaint of the chance of arranging the smallest possible self-replicating protein at random is essentially zero. As we've seen, the story of abiogenesis is far more complicated than just a molecule sprung into being by fluke. Firstly, when dealing with tiny probabilities, you've also got to look at the other side of the equation, the number of trials. When you have hundreds of millions of years and all the molecules in all the oceans of the world, then some things that seem very unlikely are in fact almost certain. The second point to note is, of course, that nobody's suggesting that any of this is happening purely by random chance. Out of the vast number of possible proteins, only a tiny minority could be formed by plausible biological pathways. However, it remains true that the likelihood of forming a self-replicating individual in one step is extremely remote. Work is focusing on how we can reduce this seemingly insurmountable gap into a few more manageable, smaller steps, as we've seen. In the last two years or so, a few vital leaps forward have been made. Proposing a creationist answer to this problem is not only failing to solve the problem, it's creating all manner of new problems. If a god or gods created the universe, then we haven't managed to explain how complexity arose. We've simply shifted the cause. A deity is a complex entity that must also be explained. We've also added into the mix the many unanswered questions that unavoidably proceed from any supernatural theory. The very early origins of life on Earth are not yet understood. As I said earlier, science has the courage to admit this, and the dedication to look at ways to resolve this problem. Studies of abiogenesis are often unfathomably complex, with extraordinary levels of study required to understand the processes involved. It's hardly surprising that we haven't yet worked out exactly how this could have happened but the vast number of possibilities mean that we have a wealth of avenues to explore. To look at a hole in our existing knowledge and see an impossibility is not only dishonest and misleading, but it's also a sign of a profound lack of desire to understand the universe and shocking intellectual cowardice which I simply cannot respect. Ultimately, this is a very difficult topic to deal with, but that's precisely why we must study it, and when we finally put the pieces together it will be an extraordinary triumph. Well, that's the end of this rather long presentation. As ever, there's loads more information on my website at frame.net, where you can also find a transcript of this talk and all the following ones and all the previous ones. And you can keep up to date with my blog, as well as learning about some of my other work. See you next time when I'll be talking about fossils and what they can tell us about the story of life on Earth.